lyrics hit home in your heart today. That is exactly what we're talking about today. The Lord Jesus is everything you need. He is everything your heart is longing for. He is everything you have been wanting and so much more. Today is week four, the final week of Advent. You have almost made it. What's Friday night? Christmas Eve. Playoffs. <laughs> That's the following week. That's the pastor's son, though, by the way. Yeah, roll tight. Today, we have gone through hope, peace, joy, and today we land on love. I am so, so excited about this. Let me have my volunteer come up and help me with lighting the candle of love today. All right, Eileen. Woo, we got this. I think the, yes, it is up here. We've been through each one of these candles. Today, we finally get to light the pink candle, the candle of love. There you go. Nice. That's a new candle. And then on Christmas Eve, there will be a white candle that appears in the middle, the birth of the Christ child. Thank you, Eileen. Give her a hand. I love that. We don't do a whole lot of traditions at Potter's Hand, but that is one that I love and is so worthy to keep. Today we talk about the birth of the child, the Christ child. I don't know if you've seen this, but there is a new phenomenon that is happening across the country where people are losing their minds. Young married couples are going through elaborate I don't know, ceremonies to announce the birth of their child or to have the gender reveal. Some of you may have seen these where they'll have these big boxes or they'll pull a giant confetti, I don't know, pinata trap or something and it will land on them. Uh, some are now putting powder that's pink or blue in balloons and tossing them in the air while other people shoot them with guns. <laughs> Sounds safe. I'm hoping it's a BB gun. Don't get any ideas. Some are doing crazy things or baking cakes, and if you slice into it, it, it's revealing the color only at the last minute, and sometimes even the, the, the husband and wife are surprised. This is, this is what people do today. I've even heard of people spending $5,000, $7,000, $10,000 on these creative birth announcements or gender reveals. Whatever method you choose, the truth is it is easy to get the word out about the arrival of a baby today. Just one little post on social media, the whole world knows in an instant. But it wasn't always that way. Hear me, young Jedi, younglings in the house. There used to be a time just 30, maybe 40 years ago, where you would have the labor of walking through your kitchen to a device mounted to the wall. This device had a little curly cue that tethered you to the wall, and you had to individually, or it may be, right? Anybody have one of those? What was this device called? The telephono, yes, yes. And you couldn't go far, and there was no privacy. And if you wanted to make a birth announcement, you literally had to stand there and enter every single number and call every single person individually. Think about that. These are crazy. There were no Zoom calls, no conference calls. You get everybody to just say it at once. No Insta-face, tic-tac, chap a snat There was none of that. You literally had to stand there and tell every single person. And if you were around even before that, you may remember sending postcards. Anybody remember those? Oh, those are great. They can be creative. In fact, I found one. This is over 100 years old. We have this photo. This is an actual postcard. I'll show you the date here in just a minute. I think it's Martha Mallory, but she should have put it up there. This was born uh, 10, 15, 10, 30. They did AM and PM, so I don't know what that's about. And I want you to know, notice the great creative artwork of the stork <laughs> and how comfortable the baby is, right? <laughs> it's so safe. I know the baby's enjoying it, which is why, boys and girls, we no longer use this method. This is, this was a, it, was a, it was an OSHA thing, and they had to stop it. But I want you to look at the front of this birth announcement because there's something really amazing about this. Notice the postmark, okay? The baby was born November 21st. This postmark is the 22nd. Just one day later, these parents didn't waste any time getting the good news out about the birth of their baby. Why? Because they were so excited. That's what new birth does. They were prepared for it. They wanted the whole world, oh, you know where I'm going with this. They wanted the whole world to know 
This is the moment. This is over 100 years ago. Yet only one day went by before they told the whole world. They were preparing for the birth of this new arrival. And that's our first truth this morning. We prepare for the birth of something new. If it's important to us, we prepare for it, right? We bake the cookies, we get the pigs in a blanket for the big playoff game, right? Y'all doing that, right? This is, this is what we do. If it's important to us, we put energy into it. We prepare for the birth of something new. The birth of Jesus is so significant, not because it just happened once a long time ago and it's ancient history. This is what we celebrate every day. We're supposed to be sharing and living and walking in the love. When people see us, they should know there is something different. So as we land the plane here, after our four weeks of Advent, we're preparing for the big Friday night reveal when the white candle shows up. What would happen if each one of us were fully expecting God to birth something new within us this season? What would change with the way we live? What would change with our level of expectancy? See, there's this great promise, a famous one that we've, we've heard a hundred times. It's back in Isaiah 7:14, and we see it fulfilled right here with the birth of Jesus. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. Literally meaning God with us. This would be the sign given to God's people that they had not been forgotten. That you don't have to wander in your sinful state or your brokenness or your chains, but instead they're going to see that a virgin is going to conceive, and they would recognize this. This is it. This is the tangible love of God coming into the world to rescue us. And the instruction given by Isaiah is very clear. Be prepared. Be prepared. Be expected. Be ready for this revelation. Live your life with the expectancy that God would come. And we, 2,000 years later, are supposed to live with the same expectancy that he will come again. We're supposed to make space for this in our lives. We're supposed to make room for the birth of the Savior. Even before the first arrival came, this was the admonition. So in the New Testament, we're going to see two Gospels here that deal with different accounts of the birth, the nativity here. Matthew and Luke. We're going to be in Luke chapter 1. If you want to follow along, I'm going to read from the New King James. And we're going to see this beautiful illustration where God writes himself into the story, enters in the middle of our mess to rescue us. And it begins with the angel Gabriel. He's speaking, if you're new to this, he's speaking to a young teenage girl named Mary. And that's where we pick up the story, starting in verse 26 of Luke 1. Look with me. It says this. Now, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to him. That means engaged. Okay, it's a little different than what we think of today. Betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, who was of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying. And she considered what manner of greeting this was. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb, and you will bring forth a son. You shall call his name Jesus. He will be great. He will be called Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. You know what's awesome about this? If you stop and really look at this, there is something hiding right in plain sight. Such incredible gold that most of us gloss right over. All right, check this out. This is so amazing. Look at the detail that the angel actually shares here. Look how he's describing this Messiah to Mary. Look at verse 31 there. He is using very specific terms. In fact, if you count them up, he is actually going to mention seven prophecies in rapid fire right here. Seven, and we miss it. But look at what he's saying. Five of them are fulfilled when Jesus comes to earth the first time. But the last two, oh, the last two are yet to be fulfilled. This is so awesome. When he returns, this time he's not going to be a helpless babe in the manger. He is going to be the righteous king of kings and the Lord of lords, and every eye will see him. Man, I hope you're on the right side. I hope you know the Savior as the Redeemer, as Counselor, as Friend. Now, check out the message translation, okay? Same, same scriptures. God sends the angel to Gabriel, and he says this. Upon entering, Gabriel greeted her. <laughs> Good morning. You're beautiful with God's beauty. Beautiful inside and out. God be with you. She was thoroughly shaken, wondering, what was behind a greeting like that? 
But the angel assured her, Mary, you have nothing to fear. God has a surprise for you. Isn't this great? You will become pregnant, and you will give birth to a son and call his name Jesus. This is so amazing. All right, I'm going to break out the, the Greek here. This is so, I was digging deep here for you guys. Listen to what it actually says in the original Koine Greek. And entered the angel to her, he spoke, you, made highly favored, must be rejoicing now. The Lord is with you. You are now made blessed among women. And when she, check, this, check out these words. Listen to how it really, really is, okay? It almost sounds like broken English, like Yoda would speak, like backwards, but it is so powerful. And when she spiritually discerned, she was made agitated by the spiritual communication of him and was reasoning what manner should this salutation be. And his angel, oh, his angel, dispatched from his breath. Think about this. His angel spoke to Mary, you must not be making yourself fearing because you have found grace with God. Grace. We just sang about that. Grace. This is the grace that forgives our sin. So powerful when you see it in the original. The message, Mary, you're going to conceive a child. Your name, you're, we already got the name picked out. You don't have to do any funky little thing or ask anyone. It's going to be Jesus. There's just one giant problem here. Do you catch it? She's not married. And she's a virgin. Yeah, I mean, she's engaged, but she's not married yet to Joseph. So this announcement was such a ridiculously hard thing for her to process. Can you imagine? She's sitting there thinking it's just going to be a normal day, and all of a sudden, this angel shows up. What do you mean I'm going to become pregnant? I know how things work. I'm, not, I'm a good girl. I'm, what, I, I don't even, I'm not even fully married yet. What do you mean you've already picked out the name? That's my job. What do you mean it's going to be the son of the Most High, a king who will rule over all these things? Mary's world was turned upside down. Overnight, boom, totally upside down. And there it is. God, when he shows up ready to do something new, there is always a disruption. Always. In fact, that is our next truth this morning. When God shows up, our lives are disrupted. Count on it. In a world that is broken and scarred with sin, when love shows up, it is disruptive. How can it not be? When God shows up like this, Mary's life is about to take a turn here that she could have never expected. Picture yourself. Be her, okay? You're 16, whatever, we, we guesstimate. And she's here. She's about to marry this nice Jewish boy for all she knows. She's already got the wedding plan. She's already got this stuff going on. She's already got the honeymoon reserved in Fiji. She can go swim with the dolphins. They've got, they've got all this plan, right? Just like you would. Typical thing. All right, they're in the desert. So they wouldn't, what do they do? They uh, pet camels? I don't know what they do. They don't swim with dolphins. Make sand castles? Can you do that with dry sand? I don't know how that works. The point is, she is expecting a pretty normal Jewish life. And just like that, it's hibbity flibbity, plickety plack cacao. A disruption drops. And she is taken back. How do you mean I'm going to give birth to the Savior of the world? Talk about a disruption. But it was a good one. What about the disruption you're going through right now? Think of Joseph. You want to talk about a disruption? An angel shows up, Mary's like, hey, listen, I got something to tell you. You're, it's going to sound crazy, but like, I'm pregnant. And he's like, I'm not the dad. <laughs> no, 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 no. The angel told me. Uh, it's it's, it's, it's going oh, to be, sit down. You're going to need a, I'm going to tell you something, right? You want to talk about this? Imagine him going to the water cooler at the carpenter shop the next day in words that you know they're going to gossip. Hey, did you hear Mary's pregnant? <laughs> Joseph. You know it. You know they talked. What is this? And Joe's like, hey, she said, it's, it's immaculate consent. I just, you know, it's kind of, you don't think that was a disruption for Joseph? Think about the political leaders. Herod, ruling with an iron fist. You want to talk about a disruption? Herod's not into power sharing. He knew if there's a new king coming, his days are numbered. They're not going to be like, hey, can I approach the baby? Hey, you want to, you want to be like co-kings? Can we do that? Would that be fun? No. We want to talk about disruption? It shocked the world. This was a massive disruption, but it was a wonderful disruption. God wrote himself into the story for you. To show up, he loved us so much, he said, I will dwell with them, and I will come through this humble young girl. All right, so here's the deal. If you're taking notes, this is your biggie for the day. There are two choices that every one of us has. 
when a disruption comes into our life. Are you ready for this? Two choices you can do. You can either avoid it or you can embrace it. Those are your two options. Now think about this. Think about what you're going through. Because disruptions, when we first see them, they're scary. I get it. Nobody, everybody says we like change. Everything, no, no, we don't. Just move the chairs once. You'll hear about it. Nobody likes change. We say we do, but we don't. It's disruptive. It's scary. And when God is trying to do something new in us, man, it can feel unsettling. Maybe even uncomfortable because he is stretching you. But what if that is what is taking us out of our comfort zone? Setting you up for something exciting. My question for us today, when disruptive love comes and drops into your world, are you going to embrace it? Or are you going to do what most of us do? Just be honest. We avoid it. Oh, that's uncomfortable. That's unsettling. Pastor Matt, I, don't, <laughs> I want to be over here in my safety zone. Right? If you need me, I'm over here in the safety zone. Just being safe. i got bubble wrap around me. i got my helmet on. Nothing can hurt me. My hand is sanitized. Showered in it. I'm ready to go. We like safety. Right? Nobody wants to be pushed and edged out of their comfort zone. Let me show you what I mean. There's a pastor named Trevor Miller. He's the pastor of Young Adult Ministries just down the road there in South Carolina. And he writes a very honest blog called Disruptive Love. How perfect is this? Okay? And I appreciate his candidness. Okay? You're going to see a little bit about pastors that we don't like to reveal. You ready for this? He says, a few years ago, I experienced the disruptive love of God. My faith had grown stagnant. And it felt like I was now just merely going through the motions, even though I served faithfully in a local church. Maybe you can identify with that. Maybe you can relate to my experience, feeling disconnected. Because honestly, when I talk to people, it's not that uncommon to lose your fire. I had recently been challenged by a dear pastor friend of mine to now be intentional in my prayer life and to begin reading the book of John every single morning. So I did. I was diligent. And I was expectant, asking God, please refresh me. Do a new work in me. So one morning, I'm sitting in my office, and I'm praying, earnestly praying. And suddenly, I feel the Spirit of God wash over me. This was something different. I haven't had many experiences like this. Sure, I've had some things, you know, where I might have failed, but before or since, this one was different. In this moment, I had the deep sense that God was still with me, and I knew he still loved me. All right, check out what happens next, okay? Listen to this. Then I felt him begin to point out specific areas in my life. One area where I had not forgiven someone who had hurt me. Then other areas where he pointed out, you need to repent. It was the most uncomfortable but comfortable feeling at the same time. I was obedient. I did what he asked. God was birthing within me a newfound passion for him. He met me right where I was, and my preparation for his presence paid off. I love that. My preparation for his presence paid off. So what about you? Maybe you're here this morning, and you've got a disruption. Maybe you just, you're listening online and you found us and you live in a different state. It's not an accident. Maybe you are facing a disruption in your world. Maybe it's a new job or a career path or something's on shaky footing right now. I know I'm talking to somebody. And you're thinking, oh, I don't know. Is this an open door here from God? I, that is not safe. You know, it's safe for me to keep doing what I've always done. Maybe you've got a disruption in your world where you're dealing with a loss. And this season always reminds you of it. Maybe it's a pain that is so right in front of you, it's hard for you to focus on anything else. Maybe you've got a disruption where you're dealing with that family member. You say, man, God, you can't redeem my son, my daughter. It's too far gone. It's too much water under the bridge. Maybe your disruption is a sin that is just about taking you down. We've all been there. There's no shame in that. Don't keep it. Give it to the Lord. These are disruptions. Maybe you're on the precipice of some huge breakthrough, and God has got you right where he wants you, and you could avoid his disruption, or you could, like Mary, embrace it. This may be God's grace and his love about to bring something new in your life. Think about this. 
Maybe you spent months, maybe years avoiding the disruption that God has been trying to use to birth something new in you, to do something incredible. But we have been avoiding. Today is the day to stop avoiding the disruptions. Start embracing where he wants to go, what he wants to do in us. See, like Mary and Joseph, God has wanted to do something through our lives that will impact the world. Not just about them. We have to choose how we'll respond. Look how Mary responds. Keep reading in verse 34. This is so classic. I love it. Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be? Since I don't know a man. The angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also, that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, who is your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her, who was once called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Listen to how the pure word actually says it. Then he spoke to Mary, the angel. She said, how shall this be? In fact, for I am knowing definitely no man. And then he says this. For with God, every single word is definitely not impossible, Mary. When you read it in the actual order, the emphatic the declarative statement of the angel. It is so, so powerful. See, Mary's asking a question. If we're honest, it's a legit question. It's not like I doubt you. It's like I don't understand how this is about to happen. It's a huge difference. Said, how will this be? See, in her mind, there is no biologically natural way that this could happen. She knows basic biology. She knows science. She knows what it takes. And she knows she has been faithful. See, in her mind, there can be no new birth because it is not humanly possible. And that's exactly the truth of it. It is humanly impossible. This is and will be 100% a miraculous act of God. And that changes everything. Mary had questions about something new. And that's our next truth. We all have questions about something new. All God's children got questions about new things because we are unsettled by new we don't like it. We say we do. We have questions about something new. We have doubts. Or maybe I should say we have our <clears throat> logical reasons why God cannot do this. We like to, we like to couch it in our, our scientific minds. <laughs> Buffet, right? We like to think of ourselves as smart. We're in control here. We're not. Think about this. Maybe you're in a position already in this disruption. You're swirling around. You say, there's no way God could love me if he knew what I've done. There's no way. I've done too many things. I've made too many mistakes. Or maybe you've heard people say near you, there is no way God can save this marriage. There's no way. It is too far damaged. It's not true. Or maybe again, going back to that relationship, there's no way God could rescue my son or my daughter and restore this relationship. There's been too much damage done. Way too much has gone under the bridge. Maybe it's more tangible. Maybe your, your disruption is your financial health. You're thinking there is no way I will ever get on top of these bills. I am destined to live a life of debt where I have it chained to my ankle and it's just my albatross. That's not true. That's not true. These are all excuses. Maybe you say there's no way, no way I could ever be clean. There's no way I could live a life sober. The addiction is just too great. The temptation is just too strong. Y'all, these are all excuses for why we can't experience new birth. But just like Mary, we point out from a human, uh, human perspective, it doesn't seem possible. But look what the angel says. This is not impossible with God. It doesn't make sense for God to be able to do a new work in us and through us. But the angel says the Holy Spirit is going to do this. It is going to overshadow you. Essentially, he's saying, Mary, what's impossible with man is possible with God. We're about to do something that is not a mere work of a mortal. It is going to change the world. We have to be honest. Our excuses, though they seem valid to us, do not hold up in the light of a powerful God. They don't. He can do anything. Do you believe that? Do you honestly believe that? This birth changed the world 2,000 ago. We're still talking about it. Still changing the world today because the same spirit that came on Mary is the same most high that can overshadow you and your problem with your spouse, 
or your marriage, or your kids, or your work, or your health, or your finances, or your testimony, or your, you fill in the blank. It's the same God. Think about this. God wants to birth something new today. He doesn't have to wait till January 1. He's not waiting for your ability. It's not about your effort or your qualifications or your gender or your track record or your status or even what football team you cheer for. Though it does help if you pull for it. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> what if we lived our lives saying, God, you can disrupt my world. What if we said that? See, I think we need to pay attention to Mary's response. Look at what she says, verse 38. Then Mary said, <laughs> behold, the maidservant of the Lord. You know what that means? That means, okay, I'm all in. I am all yours. Let it be done to me according to your word. And then the angel departed her. If I had to sum up Mary's response in one word, it would be this word right here. Surrender. Surrender or submission. Two words we don't like. Be honest. Surrender? Are you kidding? Give over control? I'm in charge. Well, is a follower of Christ supposed to be in charge? Submission. Think about what she says. One word, surrender. She opens herself up, opens her heart, says, God, whatever you want to do to me, just do it. I am all in. Here's the deal, guys. Even though her questions weren't all answered yet, she was all in. Trust me, there was a lot more she could have asked. I would have. I said, hang on a sec. I got a few questions before we do this agreement here. Right? That's what we would do. Want to know all the things? I'm just doing my research. She didn't do that. That question, she probably had tons of them, yet she is willing as she rests in God's love for her. There it is. May your word to me be fulfilled. And that's the last truth for us this morning. When we submit to God, his promises can be fulfilled in and through us. I love that. In and through us. What if this attitude of surrender became your posture this week? I mean surrender. Where he was your everything. He is what you live for. He is what you woke up for. How would our lives be different? Our submission to God has everything to do with him meeting our greatest need. What's your greatest need? When we were singing that, we were singing that song, he is, it's perfect for this. He is the supplier of all we need to experience the love and the forgiveness of a savior. There's this fantastic meme going around, it's been out for years and it says this, if our greatest need had been information, God would have sent us an educator. If our greatest need had been technology, God would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent us an economist. And if our greatest need had been pleasure, he could have sent us an entertainer. But our greatest need was forgiveness. So God sent a Savior. The world's greatest need was and is love and forgiveness of a Savior. Mary was willing to embrace this disruption. <laughs> Giving birth to the Savior of the world, think about that. So here's another question for you. If this is the same posture we choose to take this Christmas season, how might God use us? Use us to birth something new, not just for us, but to benefit someone else. See, I love this passage because his birth isn't just intended to change Mary and Joseph. We think about that. Oh, wow, look at that. Their life's up. No, no, this is what... Eventually, if we're serious, we think about this. this is, we don't like to talk about it because it sounds... It is supposed to usher in a new kingdom. There is a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem, a capital city. Like, what is that? Y'all, read Revelation 21. You'll see this. 22. I mean, as you go through it, guys, the kingdom that is coming isn't ruled by hate. It's not what we're used to, this current government. It is all new. It is ruled by love. And the broken is healed. And those who are lost are rescued. Love becomes the norm here. And hopefully, we offer this love to others. So you know i got to ask. How you doing with that? Are you keeping your light under a bushel? I know the answers to the universe, but I'm not going to tell you. Hey, we, we giggle about that because we think it's ridiculous. But isn't that kind of what we do? This love is supposed to be for everyone. Remember when I challenged you last week? If you forgot, I'll put it up for you. I, I asked this question. 
What is one way you can bring unexpected joy to someone this season? Some of you have already done it. Some of you took the challenge and you did it. I challenge us all to pray about it. Do whatever the Lord leads you to do. What sacrifice can you do to bring joy to somebody else, to point somebody to Jesus? This week, I want to ask you an even more sobering question. Are you ready? Get out your cameras. Take a picture of it. This is for you. Who needs to hear the good news of God's love? Who in your world, who in your sphere of influence, who in your work, who in your school, who in your family needs to hear the good news of God's love? What are some ways you can share this new birth? What are some ways you can share his love with others? Is it finding a local family to, to bless, to minister to? I look back there at that tree, every single card, almost 100 of them you took. You're awesome. You're blessing so many people. Some of them will have no idea what's coming. But you stepped out. Maybe it's inviting a coworker over to a meal or going out or taking the kids from someone who have marriage who just needs to spend some time together. Maybe it's putting Christ first this Christmas and establishing some new traditions. So it's not all about this and the distractions. It's about him. See, this is what happens when we believe the good news of Jesus' birth is more than just a historical fact. Some dusty little ancient thing. This is a promise that is supposed to affect our present, right? This is supposed to change us. Our lives are supposed to be changed. And as a result, we go have an eternal impact on those around us. So maybe today is the day you echo what Mary said. And you're willing to surrender. God, may your word be fulfilled. You do whatever you want to do. We've talked a lot about love. But I want to give you a word of caution about love. 1 John 2.15 tells us this. Do not love the world or the things in the world. Because if anyone does love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That's powerful. Why are we supposed to love the world? No, it's not talking about, it's talking about worldly things here. This is where the things have us. See, when we talk about surrender... And godly love, what is it that we really love most? Just be honest. You don't have to answer out loud. It's just you and the Lord, right? Be honest with him. He's reading your mind anyway, right? What is it that you genuinely, truly live for? What do you love the most? If it's the things of this world, and they're passing away. See, I think John is telling us to hold things loosely here. You know? We're supposed to live for Jesus and his kingdom. Let me show you a real-life example. In fact, we'll end with this. I'm going to go ahead and have our musicians come back up. I want to leave you with this. I ask you this question. Raise your hand if you've ever been to Disney World or Disneyland. Hmm. Okay, I did not see that coming. Good. Then you will really appreciate this. If you've ever been to Disney World or Disney, Disney, any Disney park, you may or may not be aware that most of the Walt Disney parks have a secret, exclusive VIP club known as Club 33. And it's this VIP lounge modeled after the private VIP areas of the 1967 World Fair. All right, here's a little glimpse inside this. The name was chosen by the location inspired on 33 Royal Street in New Orleans Square. Walt Disney was so excited about this. He wanted an exclusive area where he could conduct business and come and entertain all these VIPs and dignitaries and high income investors and all these special guests. Club 33 locations are actually hiding in plain sight all around the various parks. And most of us walk right by them and never even know they're there. But they're there. If you know what to look for, you can catch a little glimpse of the 33 hiding in plain sight, sometimes over a doorway. Sometimes it's in a tile on a piece of Concrete that you walk right over and you don't even know this little unassuming door opens up to the most opulent, luxurious VIP lounge that you have never been invited to. This is incredible. Sometimes as you catch a glimpse of it, there's a 33 hiding in plain sight and you think, I, maybe I should go in. You can't. You can't even join this club. Do you know how exclusive this is? The VIP club has a $33,000 initiation charge. And if that's not enough, if you've been invited to join, there is an annual $15,000 fee that you pay every single year. This was Walt's crown jewel. Guess how often he used this? 
Guess how many times he met with the dignitaries and brought in the VIPs? Zero. Not a single time. He never even got to go in it. You know why? Because he died six months before it was opened. His crown jewel, he never got to experience the luxury that he so longed for, that he designed. Y'all, there is such a powerful lesson in this. All our fancy lounges, all our luxuries, all our worldly trappings, all these trinkets that take our distractions, take our eyes off the Lord, they will disappear from our grasp the moment we step into eternity. The moment. So John is telling guys it is best to live as unattached to these things as possible. Jim Elliott has an incredible quote. He says, he is no fool who gives what he can't keep to gain what he can't lose. Wow. That's so profound. Here's the reality. A lot of people, Club 33 is as good as it will get for them. That should bring a tear to every one of our eyes. Club 33 is the highest somebody will experience without the Lord. Think about that. Club 33 is some great luxury. As, as awesome as it is as followers of Christ, we can look forward to Club Infinity with the Savior, where this kind of luxury pales in comparison. It is the most amazing thing. And guys, guess what? The initiation fee has already been paid. You couldn't pay it if you wanted to. You can't get out your checkbook. And Jesus paid for this with his precious blood. The most unique thing where red blood spiritually is poured over us and we become white as snow. How beautiful is that? Have you accepted this? Because this invitation, you're allowed to come. It's open to everybody. And no message would be complete dealing with God's love if you didn't offer a chance for you to know this. So I'm going to do that right now, right where you are. Would you just bow, just close your eyes. Maybe you're listening online, just tune out the distractions. Just focus your heart on the Lord. This is an opportunity for him to begin something new. In your own words, I'm not going to pray some cheap prayer where you just repeat after me. In your own words, pour out your heart to the Father. Tell him, God, thank you for expressing your love in the form of a baby that would be our Savior. Tell him that you agree with his word which says to seek and we'll find, to knock and the door will be opened. God, here we are. We seek, we ask, we knock. Would you forgive me for my sin? Every one of us are no different than the other. Every one of us have fallen short. Would you forgive me? God, wipe me clean. Holy Spirit, would you invade my world? Would you take control from this day forward? I confess you as Lord. Be my Savior. Thank you for paying the penalty of my sin on your cross when you were innocent and blameless. I turn my life over to you now in the quiet of this moment. Holy Spirit, take up residence. Sweep my heart clean. I pray that you would be in control and in charge from this day forward. Thank you for the power of knowing that if I call on your name, I will be saved. And it's in your powerful name, Lord Jesus, that I pray now.